in negotiation is very simple. You know, power is in size. It, the bigger you are, the more powerful you are, the more you can dictate the end result of the negotiation. And uh, you know, I think most farmers in this country would call themselves price takers, not price setters. Right? And they're, they're not just price takers for what they sell, but for what they buy as well. You know, you can't tell Exxon that I'm going to pay you less for diesel next year, right? You can't do that with John Deere. You can't do that with a bank. You can't do that with anybody that you buy the inputs, you know, from to, to, do, to produce. The one person you're bigger than, though, is the individual worker, you know? And so as a, as a farmer, it, it wasn't even necessarily intentional. It was just a factual sort of exploitation that was a way of staying afloat, right? And, and, and that, what that meant was over those 30 years of, of completely stagnant piece rates for, for tomato, a bucket of 32 pounds of tomatoes, people's lives each year got cheapened, got worsened, got diminished. Welcome to The Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of The Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish organic crops grown in healthy soils and organic livestock raised on well-managed pasture, all without synthetic fertilizers and toxic chemicals. You just heard from Greg Aspid, an organizer with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Greg and his colleague, Gerardo Reyes Chavez, sat down with Dave last winter at EcoFarm in California. They discuss the struggles and successes that the Coalition of Immokalee Workers has had in improving labor practices and living conditions for Florida tomato workers. They've taken the unique strategy of applying pressure for increased wages to the big food brand buyers, such as Taco Bell and Walmart, rather than putting the burden on farmers who are already squeezed by the system. It's an incredible success story and one that we're paying close attention to as some brands like Kroger's and Wendy's still refuse to sign on. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm talking today with Gerardo Reyes Chavez and Greg Espin, both from the Amo Coalition of Immokalee Workers. So welcome. I'm so Thank pleased you. that we got to talk. I've been speaking with you for a day now, two workshops and time in between. Um, I'm going to ask you to repeat a few of the things that you've talked about for people who weren't there. So, in, in, you know, from your own personal experiences, could you describe the Coalition of Immokalee Workers and how you came to be part of this? Um, well, for me, it was uh, the search for a job. Uh, you know, I'm a farm worker. Since I was uh, 11 years old in Mexico, I was working in the fields and I was uh, going to middle school. So whenever there was jo a job in the evenings, weekends, there was no vacation uh, because there was the need to survive. Um, and I came to Imokali because I heard about the work. I heard that if you were working in the fields back then, you could earn uh, if you were the slowest worker, you could earn like seventy dollars. But if you were fast, you could you could earn more than a hundred. And back then, you know that that seemed like a pretty decent amount of money. Yeah. Um, so I came uh, to to work, um, and when I arrived, I encountered that all of those were lies. Uh, we were working uh, a group of us uh, myself. We're working, uh, harvesting tomatoes. The boss stole our wages, um, got mad because we asked for $20 to buy utensils and basic staples because we were getting sick with the food that his uh, sister-in-law was selling. Um, and he got mad that we didn't want to continue like that. So we didn't have a job the next day. We didn't have a home, money. We didn't know anybody. That was our welcoming to Imokali. In the process of looking for a job desperately and trying to find a place to sleep, uh, we ended up sleeping in the bus of another crew leader that gave us a job. Um, and we had to be there for more than a week. In total, there was like two weeks probably uh, where we didn't have a place to go. 
Uh, so in that desperate search for a job and for a home to rent, um, we met these workers that were coming back from Chicago at the time that were part of the second case of modern day slavery, uh, the Cuello case, that the coalition of Imukali workers helped to bring to justice. Um, so it was them that introduced us to the work of the CAW that told us about how they were bought and sold um, and how they escaped uh, and got help. Uh, they were finally free, but uh, it was it was them that connect me uh, to the work of the coalition. I went to the meetings. Uh, there was uh, the last action that was focusing on trying to bring the agricultural industry to the table, a march of 234 miles. Um, and then I was learning about all the actions that happened in the 90s. Uh, and we very quickly learned about all the, the horrible conditions that are part of this job. Um, and since then, you know, um, I got involved, I started to participate, and, and then I became, you know, part of the CAW. So just, just for people who haven't been part of the conversation, Immokalee is in Florida, and it's a, a town that's kind of the, the centerpiece of the Florida tomato industry. A lot of tomatoes go in and out of that town. Yeah. yeah. And you're talking about 20 years ago that there was slavery in Florida? Well, I'm talking about how, you know, when I arrived, there was a second case of modern day slavery, but, but there's been many other cases. It, it, it was not something that happened. It wasn't it's, just a one off thing. It was something no, that no, was no. part it's, of the it's, system. It's something family. that was happening almost every year. Yeah. And uh, continues to happen, you know, outside of the protections of the Fair Food Program, which yeah. we will touch upon. Um, and that's why this conversation is so important for us. Absolutely. All right. Greg, how, how did you get to this? Yeah, uh, life is a funny thing. I mean, you know, life all takes you, if you let it, life will take you all kinds of places. And mine, uh, right after I got out of college, mine took me to Haiti for several years where I lived and, and worked and was extremely fortunate to be able to be trained by a peasant movement of Haiti named Peasant Movement of Papai, MPP. Um, in techniques of what they call animation, which is, you know, the closest thing you call it is organizing here in the United States, but it's, it's different from traditional U.S. organizing. And, uh, and so I worked for several years with animators in Haiti on uh, the process of democratization there following the Duvalier, 28 years of the Duvalier dictatorship, because I was there between 85 and 88. Um, and the experience the tools, the, the vision of, of commitment that I was able to gather while I was there in Haiti, I brought home with me um, to the U.S. when I came back. And again, without going too much into the way life moves you, um, I ended up being asked to help translate for Creole, Haitian Creole, for a farm worker lawsuit in the area of the eastern shore of Maryland where I was living. Um, which exposed me for the first time, really, in the U.S. to the reality of farm workers. I hadn't seen that before. I didn't, you know, it wasn't where I was pointed in my life before that. Um, but then having seen that and then having the language capacity and the, and the training I had, um, again, one thing led to another, and my <clears throat> wife and I moved to Immokalee, Florida, which is, as you said, it's a, it's a base community. It's a community for the entire East Coast that... Um, that is home to 20, 25,000 farm workers, you know, um, and they live there nine months of the year. And then the, the rest of the year, they travel along the East Coast to work to follow the season. Um, and so we, we moved down there to work with a, a legal services organization that uh, was working, you know, providing free legal services for farm workers who encounter problems. Um, but it happened to be that we were there at the same time that a lot of people from Haiti, from Guatemala, and from Mexico were arriving to Immokalee as refugees. They're political refugees, economic refugees, um, but arriving with the same particular set of skills, to borrow a term, um, 
that I had acquired in Haiti, skills of, of organizing and doing community education. And, and all were there as farm workers, including people I worked directly with in Haiti, just side by side, working for, for several years. Um, and we realized that together we had tools to try to address the kinds of conditions that Gerardo just mentioned um, in a way that had never been done before in the U.S., and so in the early 1990s, we started to do that. We started, we borrowed a, a room from a local Catholic church, uh, started a process of weekly meetings in town where we just, we basically brought people together who were interested in understanding and thinking critically about the conditions that they face in the field, understanding why farm workers are poor, understanding why farm workers are forced to face some of the worst abuses this country has to offer in, in labor. Um, when in fact, obviously, farm workers provide an incredibly invaluable service to the country. So why does that happen? And we started examining that question together, and that led eventually to the CIW coming together. CIW is the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. So why are farm workers poor? <laughs> why are they treated so very badly? I think that it starts with that devaluation of the humanity of workers um, in the fields um, everywhere, you know, not just here. But I think that the reason why um, in the United States agriculture we are so poor, it's, well, it's the obvious reason of the stagnation of wages. When, when we ask why those wages are stagnant, um, if we analyze, which we did, um, the forces that work on top of the agricultural industry. And that happened after uh, the first decade that the coalition was organizing several actions, you know, to, to end the situations of violence that were very common, situations of sexual harassment, uh, wage theft, uh, and in the extreme conditions of modern day slavery, along many other abuses, the compilation is big. All of those being a reflection, you know, of a power that on the top of the agricultural industry has always been worried only at, about the quality of the product. I was used to basically ask for the lowest possible price. And I'm talking about the retail food industry in this country, whether it is fast food, supermarkets, uh, food providers. Um, that type of power, the power of their purchasing order was being used to ask for a certain size of tomato, a certain state of maturity, uh, but overall uh, the lowest possible price to maximize profit. That was the easiest way for them to maximize profit, exactly. was to push down the labor exactly. and the production. That's the only place where they had the power to actually keep prices themselves that they pay stagnant. Exactly. So, so when you look at you know, the price of the bucket, like a bucket that was... Uh, being paid 40 to 45 cents. That's a bucket of tomatoes, uh -huh. uh, like a bushel. Yes, 30, yes 32 yes. pounds of tomatoes. So, so, so 32 pound, uh, pounds. At that price, you would have to pick uh, nearly two and a half tons of tomatoes just to make the equivalent of minimum wage. 30 years of that uh, same wage um, is, is no coincidence. If you look at it as an isolated thing, and don't think about what's on, on top of the agricultural industry. Um, you might not get to that point, but as a community, we were looking for um, those types of connections. Yes. And we got to the point of understanding that the extreme poverty that we as workers were uh, living with was connected to the extreme wealth at the other end of the spectrum uh, within an industry that was so powerful, that have a lot of influence, that was using the power to get those prices down, forcing the agricultural industry um, to cut cost of production by maximizing production with a lower margin of profit, but still needing to cut cost of production somewhere. The workers were paying. It was with the labor force that they were uh, saving that money to keep those contracts going. So in a way, the agricultural industry was also in the same side of the farm 
with us, but we didn't know that. It, it had to um, be a, a space of about a decade in which uh, the community had to organize dif different actions, three general strikes, a march against violence uh, in 96, the general strikes in 95, 97, and 99, a hunger strike by six workers for 30 days. All of that to try to have dialogue with the growers to talk about how to eliminate all of these abuses that I just mentioned. Um, but, you know, it, it took all of these actions to realize that the change needed to come from the top, that the real power over the industry and impacting directly, directly the lives of all of us as workers uh, needed to also be part of the solution, uh, in this case, the market. So when you started, when the coalition began, you related to the problem as being the farmers, the farm owners that, that obviously they were treating some were treating some people very badly, very illegally. But over time, you began to understand that in many ways they were in the same boat, not the same boat, but but they, they didn't have as much choice as they might have because of who they had to sell to. And, and I think that the both of us, us as workers, as well as them as growers, needed to come to the realization, which with the campaign for fair food was place in a, in a different context, you know? We were at the same time, you know, feeling that pressure in different forms. Workers suffering from conditions of poverty, having to live overcrowded in dilapidated mobile homes, uh, and then the mistreatment without any one, you know, uh, any type of power to address any of those things. Um, that was, you know, part of the way in which food was being produced. Um, all of those things were connected. And all of that gave rise to the conditions of modern day slavery, the cases that continue to arise. We needed to have the market also doing its part um, and buying in a responsible way. Um, and that's why we started to... Um, analyze, you know, what, what were the connections? There was a, an article that came up uh, on the on a magazine, uh, The Packer, yes. where Taco Bell was describing the connection they had with some of the farms um, that we were with. And uh, based on that, we understood, you know, that that connection, you know, we need to talk to Taco Bell. We need to let them know what's going on. And I'm sure that they are going to want to uh, do something about it when they knew that there's all of these abuses going on in this industry and that they could use their power to to try to help us solve all of this. But we uh, were wrong. They were not ready to hear something like that. Uh, so it took several letters. Uh, and finally, after understanding that the market was not going to move on its own, we decided that we needed to create an alliance with consumers across the country to ask them to sit at the table with us, to work with us, and use their buying power, uh, not just to get the, the highest quality possible of the products, but also to, to ask their suppliers to uh, treat workers with respect in the fields. So that was a very different strategy from where you started. Yes. Couldn't have been more different. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, we, when you are in the fields and you're working, you really, you can't see, literally almost, you can't see beyond the immediate boss, which is usually a crew leader, you know, the, the farm labor contractor. Um, and, and even in the fields in the market, where the size of the, of the farms is, is quite large, you don't even see the, the, the farmer, the owner. You don't, they don't appear in the, in the farms. Um, you just see the supervisory level. And, and when the abuses are coming from, directly from those people, the abuses that are happening directly, whether it's sexual harassment or verbal or physical abuse, whatever it is, or, or just stealing your wages, taking, taking your money, paying you half of what you're owed and, and telling you to take off. Um, that's obviously, that's, that's where your mind immediately goes is, well, if that's the problem, I need to fix that problem, right? 
but you, you realize eventually that, 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 that produce is a subset of agriculture. Right? Agriculture is just a subset of food. And that whole industry is connected. So the food, the buyers of produce don't just buy and sell produce. They buy and sell everything in, ter- in, the, in terms of food. And the purchasing power they have, especially over those 30 years of stagnant mm-hmm. wages, the purchasing power that they accumulated. And you think about it, this was 50 years ago, right? At this point, when, when you start counting those 30 years. Walmart was just a few stores. Yeah. 50 years ago, which is impossible to believe at this point, but it was just a few stores, right? McDonald's, the same thing. It was just a, it was a chain that was just starting. All those things, were, and, and they didn't have the purchasing power of 10,000 restaurants that, that, they, that they could wield. And, and, and when you look at markets, really, all they are is a, a network of negotiations, right? From the top to the bottom. And in negotiations, it's very simple. You know, power is in size. It, the bigger you are, the more powerful you are, the more you can dictate the end result of the negotiation. And I, you know, I think most farmers in this country would call themselves price takers, not price setters. Right? And they're, they're not just price takers for what they sell, but for what they buy as well. You know, you can't tell Exxon that I'm going to pay you less for diesel next year. Right? You can't do that with John Deere. You can't do that with a bank. You can't do that with anybody that you buy the inputs, you know, from to to do to produce the one person you're bigger than though is the individual worker you know and so as a as a farmer it it wasn't even necessarily intentional it was just a factual sort of exploitation that was a way of staying afloat right and 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 that what that meant was over those 30 years of of completely stagnant piece rates for for tomato a bucket of 32 pounds of tomatoes people's lives each year got cheapened got worsened got diminished uh, and at some point, the community in the early 1990s decided that it was enough. And, and the problem was that the analysis hadn't, been, hadn't emerged yet from the process of, of, of organizing and critically analyzing the, the situation. So the first actions were traditional sort of, you know, attempts at bringing employers to the, into dialogue. And, and the results were minimal. But once, once we realized that, that, in fact, what Gerardo was, was explaining, that behind what we immediately see, there's much greater power. And at that greater power, it's possible to harness that power to reverse the impact and make it use the, the, the power of those buyers to not just improve wages, but more importantly, to improve conditions, to actually create, to demand human rights compliance from their suppliers. Because they can demand anything they want from their suppliers, given their power, given their size. And they just simply hadn't needed to. Nobody was asking them or demanding that they demand from their suppliers compliance with fundamental human rights. And that was the campaign for fair food. That's what we, what we launched. It was a different idea back in, in 2001. It, was, it took a long time to, to explain to the public what we meant by fair food. Um, but amazingly, beautifully, it worked. So critically, it wasn't actually that you went and convinced Taco Bell or Walmart Absolutely not. That, that they should change because they should be better companies. It's that you went to their customers. Right. Because again, markets are negotiations. Right? And it, the market, we all think as, as consumers that Walmart is the biggest buyer in the world. And in fact, they are the biggest individual buyer in the world of most things. Right. But Walmart sells too. So the biggest buyer is actually the consumers who buy, who have all the purchasing power in the world. Right. But consumers, as a rule, act individually. They don't act collectively. They don't act, they don't purchase in any kind of collective way. What we did was to say, we need you as consumers to tell Taco Bell that you won't buy from Taco Bell if they don't demand human rights compliance from their suppliers, where we work, where the, where the, the farm workers in, in the market work. It was, it was an idea that had, you know, obviously boycotts had happened before, but the end result that we were looking for was actually a legally binding agreement with Taco Bell, between Taco Bell and the, the farm worker community, that they would only buy from growers who protect their workers' rights. And that was new. That was entirely novel. Um, yet, somehow, after four long years, we managed in 2005 to negotiate a binding legal agreement with Taco Bell just at that, 
it just that, just to help people understand a little bit in those four long years what was the actual campaign that you did to reach the consumers and persuade them well we we organize in our community and we leave the fields basically start working in the fields for two weeks at a time um, got into two buses and a couple of bands and just drive all the way from Imokali, stopping in 15, sometimes 17 different cities uh, on the way to Irvine, California, where the headquarters of Taco Bell is. And then <clears throat> in that process, we realized that uh, its parent company, John Brands, uh, had the power to sign the agreement. So we made, made it two steps as we were progressing into that campaign for Fairfield. Um, that meant for us uh, stopping and making connections with students at universities, uh, visiting churches, staying in church, uh, the, the floors of churches uh, and making presentations there, um, doing actions, you know, marches uh, in, in every place that we could coordinate with the communities that we were visiting on the way to uh, California and back. And it was through that that at the end of the boycott, uh, four years from being a absolutely unknown community, Imokali literally didn't appear in many maps even, um, to become the uh, point of reference at that moment of uh, farm workers fighting desperately to be able to have rights in their workplace and, and, and their dignity protected. So there were 300 universities that were organizing in solidarity with uh, the farm workers of Imokali. There were uh, 32 different denominations that in one way or another represented by the National, um, the National Council of Churches. Um, they heard about this fight and that opened the door of many churches that wanted to do their part. Uh, so it was that kind of support as well as the connections we did uh, with uh, workers in different cities, different states, um, that brought Taco Bell to realize that it was time for them to, to reconsider their position. Um, the students started their own campaign, uh, which they call Boot the Bell, which consisted in basically asking the administration to cut uh, any ties that they had with Taco Bell as a corporation until they come to the table. There were 28 uh, contracts, uh, including some athletic sponsorships and some actual restaurants that uh, lose their ability to be in, in uh, 28 different universities uh, because of the campaign. That, along with all the actions that were taken um, across the nation with us, uh, led to Taco Bell and then John Brands finally coming to the table to sign the agreement in 2005. And, and, and to that immense credit, I mean, it, it was, a, it was a, a, a struggle. It took four years. But they took a step that nobody had ever taken before in the end. They did something that no other corporation had ever done before and took that leap of faith. And it was, a real, it was actual leadership. You know? and, and the proof is in the pudding because after Taco Bell did sign this agreement saying that we will only buy from growers who are respecting workers' rights. And workers will be the people who determine if that's the case and will pay a premium to help improve wages. Thirteen more corporations followed suit. So what they did was, was, was an actual act of leadership that actually established the first, the first worker-driven social responsibility agreement, the, the, the model, the, the, the Fair Food Program that gave birth to a model that's now broadly called in, 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 in countries across the, the globe. In several, we're operating in five continents now, I'm not wrong, um, that established those ideas that one, these companies are responsible for the human rights conditions at the bottom of their supply chains. Mm -hmm. Two, that they have the power to improve those conditions through selectively purchasing from suppliers who actually respect their rights. Three, that workers need to be the leaders in the, in the need to be frontline monitors of their own rights and, and determining whether suppliers are in compliance. And four, the, 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 the premium to help improve wages or to help improve conditions, some sort of price premium is essential to help actually concretely change people's lives. 
those principles now are are in operation in supply chains from uh, Bangladesh and textiles in Southern Africa and Lesotho. They're they're adopting it in the UK in the fishing industry. They're they're we're in South Africa and Chile, uh, possibly in Mexico. It's now become clear to workers around the world at the bottom of these global supply chains that the same dynamics that took us a couple of decades to understand uh, exist everywhere. You know, that, that, that chain of, of power that creates poverty and abuse in its, in its normal operation can actually be changed. It can actually be reversed and it can help Im- diminish the poverty of the people at the bottom of the, of the supply chain and help end the abuse if properly harnessed, properly motivated. And that's, and that's happening. That process of, of, of harnessing the purchasing power of these major brands is happening in supply chains around the globe today. At, at, at no great damage to either the farms or the multinational corporations. On the contrary, at, to their benefit. To because their benefit. It, it, is a, it is damaging. Take Kroger. Kroger so far is a company that's refused to join the Fair Food Program. It's a massive company. Kroger has been connected over the past four years to three major forced labor operations by U.S. Department of Labor, by the Justice Department. For some reason, Kroger seems to think that that's okay, that three major forced labor operations being connected over the course of four years is an acceptable outcome. And I I can't understand how that's the case. Even less is it possible to defend that position when you consider that there is a program, the Fair Food Program, which has proven and every single law enforcement agency in the country stands by this, to be the only certification program capable of stopping or preventing forced labor. So there's a solution, there's a problem, and yet companies like Kroger still refuse to actually adopt the solution for whatever reason. So there is a lot more work to be done, but that can't be good for Kroger. Kroger wants to uh, acquire Albertsons, the issue of of their connection to to the, the sort of supply chain slavery problem is coming up in those conversations, mm-hmm. right? That, that's not good for Kroger. That's something that they should actually solve and put behind them, yeah. but, and, they, and the opportunity is there to do so. Yeah, yeah. And, and, the, and they, they spend resources in, in not in coming on to what a real solution is, which would be really easy for them to just join, sign onto the program yeah. and commit to do the same thing that 14 other corporations are doing and it's being shown to the world. It's something that is inspiring workers in many other places um, to to don't have any of those situations connected to their brand. And they don't have to this, be pioneers. This makes like, them look good. Right, they don't have exactly. to, to do anything like groundbreaking right. or that requires a lot of work for them. They simply have to, you know, do what others are doing and 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 continue with their business. And I acquire sus- Albertson and be, be a leader, you know? Yeah, I suspect that their fear of losing control is so great that they'd rather be in control of something terrible. Right. Yeah. I mean, what, are they, what do they control? I, hopefully they don't control the, 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 the results that they are getting now from their current yeah. approach. Because yeah. if, if they are afraid, you know, of losing control, then they are losing it anyways. Right because they are associated with things that I'm sure they wish they were not, but their own positioning on the wrong side of history Stubborn. is, is bringing them, you know, to, to look horrible uh, and, and be part of the problem in front of, of a world in which, you know, these kinds of pieces of information flow really quick and their brand is suffering, I'm sure, uh, the, the a damage to their reputation that they shouldn't have. Yeah, they they could have like beautiful publicity. They could be the great leaders, exactly, and, and celebrated. And yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're doing so much to lead so many corporations to that. One last question. I know you got to go. Mm-hmm. I know you got to go. But we talked earlier about NAFTA, and I was just really struck by <laughs> talking about that. That was kind of pivotal po- point in that. It essentially impoverished small farmers in both Mexico and the United States, and it created a shift in the agriculture to much larger centralized farms. Did I get that right? Well, in Mexico, uh, what happened was that 
you will see how corn from the U.S. was uh, brought onto the Konasupo stores controlled by uh, the, the government over there uh, as a way to, you know, decrease the cost of living in, in impoverished areas in Mexico. And what, what happened is that if you were a producer of corn for generations, then all of a sudden you didn't have um, a price for your product, for your own corn. And, and people that were poor had to, you know, buy the, the cheapest option, which was working against um, th those already impoverished communities. So the way of living for many small farmers was destroyed. Uh, and people had to find a way to still put food on the table. So you go to the big city, you go to uh, uh, the, the maquiladoras, uh, whatever there was a job. And that basically forced the migration of many workers uh, onto the U.S. too. Yeah. And, and real quick on that point, you know, before and after the, the, the split of the market between the United States and Mexico for providing, satisfying U.S. demand for tomatoes, for example, was probably between 80, 20, 70, 30 U.S., you know, 20, 30 from, from Mexico. Today, that's been flipped. It's probably about 20 or 30 from U.S. production and 70 or 80 percent from Mexican production, satisfying U.S. demand for tomatoes. The problem with that is, in the interim, the U.S. tomato industry has become the best workplace for farm workers in the United States in large-scale production. It's got the Fair Food Program. It is a leader. It is the leader in, in human rights for farm workers in, in the produce industry. While Mexico has done little or nothing to, to help farm workers, and farm workers have absolutely no protections against violence, against retaliation, if they do bring up problems at work, because there's, there's, no, there's no program and there's corruption and violence and all the other things that, that happen all the time. And in incredibly Mexico. low pay. And incredibly low pay. So what, we've, what NAFTA has achieved is, is taking all that production, all those jobs, all, that, all, that, all the lives connected to the production of tomatoes from the best workplace in, in the produce industry today, and shifted it to, to some of the worst workplaces. And, and it's because price is the dominant factor in most buyers' decision-making. Mm -hmm. That's not going to change anytime soon. And it's, it's a crime. It's a crime because there is, there is a program in the Fair Food Program that absolutely has changed lives. It's eliminated sexual assault. It's eliminated forced labor, eliminated wage theft, all those things. It's, it works, and it's proven to work. And every law enforcement agency in this country agrees. Mm -hmm. And yet, NAFTA took those jobs, shifted them to Mexico, and they're going to stay there for some time. So, so now, ironically, you know, from the five million, which is what they estimated NAFTA would display um, out of the fields, the, the, the five million small farmers, that those who are working here now, forced out by economic reasons um, of their own realities, and are part of this uh, program, as are part of, of, of the fair food program, you know, working in all of these farms. The hope, you know, in expanding the protections that we have already learned in Florida, working with the growers and with these 14 corporations, expanding it to several states uh, up the East Coast, uh, to Colorado, to California, um, it's those you know, realities that force people out, that forces them into the conditions that we were forced to work to change, that have the possibility of now bring those protections back because the market, the corporations, you know, um, are everywhere, including Mexico. So if we are able to expand the fair food program to more farms in the United States, uh, there's also a possibility down the line that this might be something that we can help establish back in Mexico too. Yes. By the same forces. I know. Thank you so much, guys. I All really right, appreciate absolutely. it. I know you got to go. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. Our movement is growing because you're subscribing and sharing these podcasts with your friends. So keep it up and leave us a rating and a review as well so that others can find us. You can find a video version of this interview on our newly designed website, realorganicproject.org, or on our YouTube channel. And you can join us every Thursday for a new episode featuring voices from the organic movement. 
See you next time.